In a casting show, Tom Franz conquered Israeli hearts with his cuisine. The German became Israel's master chef. Now he's taking us on a culinary expedition. My fascination with Israel and Judaism started with the people. First the people, then the country. As soon as I got off the plane, smelled the air, saw the light, the trees, the vegetation, the architecture, it was kind of like coming home. It was like coming home even though it's all so different here and alien to me. It's like from the very first day I had arrived already. It was also love at first sight for Tom and his wife Dana, whose family survived the Holocaust. When I met Dana, I probably didn't know straight away that she was the answer to everything. But my feeling was that I had to get to know this woman. This guy was passing by me a few times, back and forth, and I thought to myself, he's a good looking guy. Maybe he'll come and say something to me. And he really came by. And basically, we didn't part since then. Such a beautiful face. Such a beautiful face. In the beginning, it was difficult. I think that for every Israeli meeting someone German, the first thing that would come to their mind, depending on the person's age, would be what did his parents do in the Holocaust time? Or what did his grandparents do? Many people have a, a distance from Germans. And Tom, when he went to MasterChef and they saw him as a person, with his German qualities that he brought to MasterChef, they had a good feeling that this German guy is really great, he's really good, he's really interesting, he's talented, and it made them think that Germans in general, it's funny, but it made them think that Germans in general are cool. And this is really an impact he had. Today, we're on our way from the desert to Jerusalem with Tom Franz. The Negev. This desert accounts for half of Israel. And since the foundation of the state, they've been working on the dream to make it fertile. Our culinary trip takes Tom to an oasis in the southern part of the country. It's the date plantation of the Samar Kibbutz. Some 7,000 trees rise majestically 30 meters into the desert sky. A hydraulic platform takes Tom comfortably to the ripe fruit. They're bringing in the annual harvest. When the harvest is due in Samar, the entire village helps, as well as volunteers from Germany who want to sample the sweet fruit and an alternative concept of life. Carol from Mannheim is a media designer and is spending nine months in the desert commune. Okay, when does it start in the morning? Uh, Around five. Five. At five? Full half. The night harvest or the normal one? No, the morning one. The night harvest starts at 10 p.m. Okay. And takes until 5 a.m. These organic honey dates are the main source of income for this kibbutz. They're popular all over Israel for their butterscotch flavor. Mild. Not quite so sweet. Not quite so sweet, right? But pleasant. Mm, mm, wonderful. Wonderful.
Most of the kibbutzes in Israel are privatized. In some are, they still live the socialist idea, but not in its original form. After they grew up in Israel's first kibbutz, the founders didn't want at some point to subordinate their lives to the common good. In Samar, Musa and Jair have put a new revolutionary idea into practice. Basic idea of the regular old traditional kibbutzim was the collective, the commune, be, is before the individual. The individual is part of the commune, is part of the collective, and he has to surrender his will to the needs of the collective. The founders of Samar, they took this idea and simply turned it around and put it upside down. The well-being of the individual is more important than the collective. In Samar, no one tells the other people what to do. Everyone is free to do whatever and however much work he wants. Bicycle freaks opened a biking hotel. Desert lovers offer excursions. In daily life, what does it mean for a member of the kibbutz? My uh, responsibility for, for myself and for the kibbutz is to take care that uh, some, I bring in enough money to feed income. the kids, income. Uh, and I'm happy to do what and nobody asks me it's only my responsibility. It's a dream for me to become true. In the other kibbutz, they say, be happy with what you do. In Samar, it's the other way around. Do what makes you happy. <laughs> Sounds utopian. 200 kibbutzniks live in the collective. They all share one credit card. That's what you have for breakfast every day? Yes, this is our breakfast. Every morning at 10 a.m. we all come together again. Looks good. It's typical dishes, tahina, egg salad. The classic Israeli breakfast of tomatoes and cucumbers is really good. Coriander pesto. Just like the rest of the buffet. The best experience for me was the realization that it's possible to live differently without the compulsion to buy stuff. There are no obvious hierarchies. There is one pot of money everyone draws from. Some people exclusively work in the kibbutz, but other members also work outside as teachers, doctors, professors. And their salaries also go into this joint account. We don't need any money. That's a great aspect. Yes, particularly that. You walk around with no money in your pockets, sometimes without shoes, without keys. No keys. No need to lock your room. It's all free. That's something. What did your friends in Germany say when you said, I'm off now, I'm going to Israel, to a kibbutz? Um... <laughs> Many thought it was a bit crazy. Because people in Germany have a certain image of Israel. They see images of Gaza on television, bombings of houses, and they think that all of Israel looks like that. That was one thing. And then when I said I want to go to a kibbutz, they smoked, because usually it's farm work. They have 300 dairy cows, their own workshops, and even a Steiner nursery school in Samar. Everything is jointly owned. The system is based on trust, and it doesn't always work, but it's been in practice for 40 years now. Susanna Tamir is from Würzburg. When she was a student, she did an internship in education in Samar and stayed on for good. When you're in a tight spot, there is always someone there to help you. You're never alone. And for children, I raised my daughter by myself and I could not have offered her a life like this in a town or if I'd been all alone. The help you get from the community is a very special thing. 
And from the people I learned that you can engage with people in a very different way, that you live much more in the moment. It's all much more spontaneous. By now, this desert kibbutz has attained cult status. More and more young families want to live there, work there and be happy there. Samar is not complete or perfect. Ideas are tested and dismissed. But the vision of an alternative form of life in a heavenly place, it has worked out. It's hard to persuade Tom to continue the journey to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall. It's 6 a.m., time for the first prayer of the day. Tom puts on the tefillin, the prayer strips with which practicing Jews symbolize their connection with God. Tom converted to Judaism when he moved to Israel. He is living his faith with all his soul. At least once a week, Tom goes to pray at the Wailing Wall the last remaining stones of the ancient Jewish temple. Today, the Al-Aqsa Mosque is on top of them. It's one of the most important Muslim shrines. For Tom, the capital of Israel is more than just the spiritual center of religion. It is also an El Dorado for good food. Next to the Wailing Wall, the shops in the Arab quarter of the old town are waking up. It's time for breakfast. Tom is supposed to meet De Vio Hollander, one of the best guides through the narrow alleyways. On the menu is the city's speciality, hummus. When I said uh, a local hummus place, this is what I'm talking about. This looks special, it looks good. Hummus is made of pureed chickpeas with tahini. Tahini is a paste made of roasted sesame seeds and other ingredients. Depending on the chef, you can get hummus with broad beans too. Hummus is the street food of the Middle East and almost as important as religion. It is good hummus. This for me is the trinity. The holy trinity of hummus. One dish of traditional hummus with some chickpeas on the top. One dish of sabacha. The whole chickpeas, they're not really crushed into the paste. A lot of tahini, a lot of tahini on top of it, a lot of lemon, a lot of olive oil, and the full. The faba beans with the chickpeas on top of it. Is hummus an Israeli or an Arabic dish? I only pray that our battles will be about the, the question you just asked. And, and if that were the battles, I don't mind losing it. And our peace to eat it together. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, but I think, you know, you can use that as a microcosmos to the situation, that even the food, something that should unite the people. And come on, we're walking around here in the old city, and you see how the food is uniting the people. I mean, there are a lot of Israeli Jews that come to the Arabs to eat hummus. They like the Arab hummus and they eat together, right? Nothing, nothing wrong no with that. No, no, nothing, nothing wrong with that. And I say, good food, no, no one owns it. Everyone adds a little twist and makes it just better and better. And now, Tom, our weapon, the pita bread. Yeah. No need for a fork or knife. Absolutely not. Legendary. Oh, absolutely. This is a place I can eat again and again, and every time, the first bite, it's the first bite that you realize you're up for a treat. Of 
course, the Shuk of the Old Town offers a wealth of fresh herbs, vegetables and fruit, apart from hummus. Tom has arrived at the Arab butchers and is curious about some of what's on show. Next door, they ask him in to have a look at the kitchen. Diminutive Hajj Faraj is one of the city's most well-known chefs. Oh, what a good smell. This is lamb's brain. I cook it with water, lemon, salt and onion. I fill the vine leaves with veal, lamb and tomato. This is made with veal and potato. I fill it all in a net made out of the entrails of a lamb. I've never cooked with that before. Once you eat it, you'll always love it. What's indispensable for the locals as well as the tourists at an oriental market are the spices for the cuisine of a thousand and one nights. Jakub and Isaac's family have been trading in herbs, traditional medicines and exotic flavors for over 400 years. I would like uh, to take some, some, some saffron. You have saffron? Sure. Yeah, I, I will get you a good uh, quality. Uh, this is the Persian one. Uh, Persian is Iran. Iran, exactly. To bring uh, some uh, spice from Iran to Israel, it must be. Uh, it's, I know, it's, not it's, too it's easy. a longer trip. That's why. But when you hear the price, you will understand <laughs> that it's possible. <laughs> this is about half a gram. One kilo is about thirty thousand shekels, which is about nine thousand dollars. Okay, so. Which means half a gram cost? It's like about four dollars. And this is the best saffron uh, in the world? Uh, yes, this one and the, the Spanish one and the Persian one are the best one. This is a very special mixture that we're going to make for you that goes for all kind of cooking you're making, no matter what you're making, rice, chicken, vegetables. You just need to put from this amazing mixture with a little bit of salt to your home and, and you'll get the best for everything, yeah, for all exactly. purposes. Yeah. May I smell it? Of course, you may smell it, you may taste it. Wow. Wonderful. The Via Dolorosa, Jesus' Way of the Cross, runs straight through the Arab Quarter. Located at the intersection of the roads leading to the sacred sites of the Christians, Muslims and Jews are the Austrian Hospice and its Viennese coffee house. It's a place of silence. Under the watchful eye of Emperor Franz Josef, Tom is meeting with Father Nicodemus, a Benedictine monk and expert on Jerusalem. Yeah, Jerusalem is a city that makes me every day kiss and bite. Jerusalem is a city which kisses and bites me every day. When I leave the house, I have wonderful experiences and encounters with people addressing me spontaneously, telling me, Father, please bless me or something. You're bang in the middle of a conversation about faith, no small talk. But I also get spit at or cursed by extremist groups. It's very intense. I would only find a life this intense here. I love Jerusalem. The Dormitio Abbey is on top of Mount Zion. It's Father Nicodemus's monastery. Next door, Jesus celebrated the Last Supper. The tomb of King David is also supposed to be here. It's a sacred site for Jews. One floor up, Muslims prayed in a mosque for centuries. The 
monks pray before lunch. At the monastery, food has another dimension, a religious dimension. We have two centers of our communal life. It's the church, our prayer and the refectory, the dining hall, where we eat together. That which we celebrate at the altar is a kind of stylized eating, which has a higher meaning. Because in our faith we receive God ourselves, we meet him personally. So it's a very deep relationship. And we have this prayer where God brings us together for the banquet of heavenly peace. It's Christianity's idea of paradise, actually, a banquet with God. So every meal is a taster of paradise. Today, Swabian Spätzle are brought into the dining hall through the monastery's tunnels. Nicodemus serves them with selected food for the mind. From the holy scripts of the Old Covenant, the Lord your God will cut off before you the nations you are about to invade and dispossess. But when you have driven them out and settled in their land, and after they have been destroyed before you, be careful not to be ensnared by inquiring about their gods. Nachdem sie bei deinem Angriff vernichtet worden sind. Wenn du dem Herrn deinem Gott dienst, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. Wenn sie ihren Göttern dienten. I love the roof of our study house, Bert Joseph. I myself studied here. My room was facing Jordan. What you see in the background there is actually Jordan. And before that, Silwan, the Arab quarter of East Jerusalem. There are some settlers living there at the moment too. You can also clearly see the wall, which is probably the latest scar in Jerusalem's history. It was built because there were numerous suicide attacks in the Second Intifada, and it's meant to be a security facility. But the other side of the story is, unfortunately, that this wall is separating families and creates personal suffering. I hope that this city will find peace and everyone can find whatever they are seeking. Security, freedom, peace. And we monks pray for this every day. I think Jerusalem is like a woman who doesn't wear makeup. It openly shows 4,000 years of history, including all the wounds and scars of that history. Jerusalem doesn't pretend, Jerusalem doesn't seek to please. An Israeli police presence on the roofs in the Arab quarter is meant to increase security, but at the same time, it's a provocation. As a passerby, you can suddenly witness how controversial this little patch of holy ground is. Following attacks by Palestinians and Orthodox Jews, the Israeli police have blocked access to the big mosque in the old town. But 10 police officers don't stand much of a chance against a hundred pious Muslims. There is another way. No matter how conflictual life in Jerusalem can get, Jews, Muslims and Arabs can also work together naturally. Just a few meters away, six chefs are meeting up. Moshe Basson, well known for his biblical dishes, is welcoming Tom and a few other chefs for a special cooking session. Very nice cake, beautiful. A 
warm friendship unites the Chefs for Peace. They're a group of Jewish, Christian and Muslim chefs. They make use of their culinary art at large events to bring people of different faiths to the table. What are these special meats? This is the fire in Jerusalem. And we start with three chefs, and today we're around 15 chefs in the group, all between Muslims, Christians, and Jews. This is the whole idea, to have the three religions in one group. When you cook together, what cuisine do you cook? I mean, you, you are located here in Israel, you have three face. What will I get on my plate? We believe in coexistence, we believe in love, we believe in fun cooking together. This all merges in our plates. So you, in there you can have my touch as a Christian Aramaic chef, the touch of Chef Moshe Basson as an Israeli Jewish person who lives in Jerusalem and was raised using his biblical heritage cooking, Chef Ibrahim as a Muslim and with his traditions and the faith in cuisine. So it's a melting pot for food. So take another leg. No, you are in the Middle East. You have to eat it Use like this. <laughs> mm. yep. mm -hmm. Have a gift, gift. Mm -hmm. Could this also be a recipe for more peace in the Middle East? Or is it naive to eat together in peace? From the old town with its many religions over to the Jewish west of Jerusalem and to the emigrants from the Middle East with their oriental traditions. The Iraqi market is the very lively old people's home for the Israeli population of Jerusalem. Here, Jewish street food is served with tradition. Patil is the name of these traditional cookers in the Asura restaurant. But their fire is small and the dishes are melted rather than cooked. But each dish is a journey through the world of the Near and Middle East. Wow. You eat the chicken with the... It's the chicken... With the beef. Chicken and beef together, they have... Yeah. I mean, they bring out a, you like don't a new dimension of uh, flavor. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. You know, the, this is an interaction from, from two things. Yeah. Nobody... Uh, it's, it's one plus one is not two. One plus one is three. Two. <laughs> yeah, it's like this. This is semolina. It's like a dumpling. Yeah. Inside it's uh, beef and the uh, soup is beet. Yes, it's red beet. It's red beet and the... Uh, uh, wonderful color. The color is uh, wonderful and the taste it, it's a little it's bit sweetie. Ah, it's sweetie? This is the Iraqi kube. It's different kube from this one. Okay, this is also kube soup? Yeah, this is also kube soup with mango, zucchini, oh, mango and, zucchini. and celery. Hmm. Yeah, and these nice come from Kurdish. Ah, this is Kurdish? This is Kurdish, and if you want to test it... Mm. It's a bit sour. Sour, yeah, a little is bit sour. Is it with lemon juice? Or? Yeah, the lemon juice. It's very good. It's good. I like. <laughs> <laughs> It's Khalab Kube. It's, it's come from Syria, Syria Khalab. Okay. okay. It's called Drish. Drish, it's some kind of uh, semolina and inside meat. The soup here, it's with chickpeas. Ah, it's with chickpeas. And it's very, very, very hot. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I can see a lot of chili. Red hot chili peppers. Yeah, hot chili pepper. You know, in uh, here in Israel, it's called Kube 
Kube Taklit. Taklit. Ah, a record, like a vinyl record? Yeah, yeah, it's a, a big one. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's a big it's disc. It's a big disc. Yeah. Yeah. With the song. If you hear it, you hear the song. <laughs> This is Israeli uh, society. It's come from all of the country. And uh, we take from this and this and this. And we make a kitchen. We take here. the best from every, from every yeah. kitchen. Slow food, Jerusalem style. It goes without saying that Asura is an old family restaurant. Shabi Schaeffler learned his trade from his father, and he still occasionally asks for his advice. Shabi's big neighbor and the most important supplier for his kitchen is the Mahani Yehuda market, the Jewish counterpart to the more Arab shuk in Jerusalem's old town. I mean, look at this. Have you seen something like this? Of course, the German master chef has to pose between onions and potatoes for a selfie with Shabi's friends. <laughs> On 10 market streets, more than 250 regional traders offer their wares. There are veritable mountains of vegetables, fruit, and anything else that can be eaten. At Mahana Yehuda Market, you will find all kinds of people, rich and poor. The Mahani Yehuda restaurant next to it is more a part of hip Jerusalem. Kosher style is not on offer in Chef Asaf Granit's kitchen. All of you have a special connection to, to the market Mahani Yehuda. You took the name out, so you just yeah. changed a little bit of spelling. What's your special connection like? Can you describe it? Me, as a chef, I've grown up in Jerusalem. Since I started cooking, I used to finish my shift and almost every day go up to the market, walk around. When I, I didn't know a lot about food, just walk around, go to the fish store and just ask what's that, what's that, is that in season, what, what's special about this fish, just learning from, from the, the people who are selling in, in, in the market till they just told me, if you're not buying, go away. At Mahani Yahuda, the kitchen becomes a stage. The chefs are dancing and singing, while always using a bit more fire for their dishes than other places. Some dishes have achieved legend status. So, what I'm doing now is uh, our most signature dish, which is the soft polenta with asparagus and uh, parmesan. Uh, so we start off with the uh, polenta, which we cook in uh, a lot of milk, butter and parmesan till it's really, really creamy as you can see. So a few spoons of the polenta. And then we warm up some mushrooms that we saute in a little bit of olive oil, and a little bit of white wine. Now the mushrooms go in. The asparagus as well, a little bit of parmesan chips, and a little bit of truffle oil. Close it, and then you're done. It looks delicious. Enjoy it. Thank you. It goes without saying that the waiting list for a table is long. Recently, the star chef also opened a branch in London. As a cook in Jerusalem, I, I was influenced a lot by the Palestinian kitchen. Uh, I love it, I love eating it, and I love cooking it. And many of my dishes here in Machne Yehuda and, and in London are influenced, and some of them are just typical Palestinian dishes with a small twist, our twist, and they are always loved. I can see it now much better in London, 
I, I, I serve people from countries I will never meet here. And all we talk about is food, wine, life in London, life in general. Food, food becomes the topic and not politics. It, it's a great tool to use to come over boundaries. So what you say is food can become the recipe for peace? Definitely. Food is a mirror and a window to a lot of things that are not food. To understanding different cultures through food. For, for a Polish kid to eat Moroccan food makes him understand Moroccan people much better. Food is, is a great ambassador for them. It's hard to believe how idyllic the area outside the gates of the Holy City is. Just a few kilometers away are the Judean hills. Situated in the heart of them is Israel's oldest gourmet restaurant. It all started with yoga. Rama Ben Svi was a dancer in Jerusalem before she opened a restaurant in her garden in Natav 20 years ago. People who know about it come from all over Israel to visit Rama's kitchen. Head chef Toma Nif has worked in world-class restaurants in Copenhagen and London. It was Rama's biggest coup to lure this master conductor to her village orchestra. Toma says he can't imagine a better place. Here everything is well-grounded. Maybe that's why the quality is superb. Love of nature can be felt in the food and in every little detail of the decor. Rama's husband made the tables from unplaned wood. The bowls are carved from olive wood. And the ceramic crockery is handmade too. This is pesto of coriander leaves with olive oil. I love, I love. Yeah, you know, just, you know, let's just cut the bread and then you can dip it in the, in the seeds and then. This is our variation to hummus but we do it with beetroot. It's very nice, I like it. How far is the food you serve in your restaurant expression of your concept or philosophy of life? When we were doing yoga this morning, I was talking about self-tuning. I was talking about balancing. So also in what I'm doing here, I'm looking all the time, like this is, I think, a very important thing for me in my life, balance, harmony. The food, I find it very accurate and plays on the very thin line between being sophisticated and being simple, being fine and being coarse. We root ourselves, also the food, you know, food has a lot of rooting qualities. So the concept that I had in my mind is that everything that has to do with the restaurant would be a part of the main experience here, which is nature, which is being in nature, smelling, feeling the wind, seeing the butterflies, feeling the butterflies. Toma shows Tom the roots of his cuisine, vegetables and herbs which he grows in the gardens around the restaurant. The rocky soil intensifies the flavors. In summer it's very, very uh, long periods without rain and the uh, herbs, they uh, become extremely uh, dehydrated and then the water comes out and the flavor stays. So it's like a, 
natural reduction of flavor. Thomas, what are you going to cook with me? We're going to make a, a fish, a wild fish that I brought from Jaffo. We make this kind of a bed of herbs for the fish, not to get the fish touching the actual pan. And uh, on top we will put this uh, caramelized uh, sumac onions. It's a very important spice in Arabic cuisine. Yeah. And now it's ready to go into the oven. The herbs enhance the flavor of fish, marinated in pesto on a bed of rosemary and thyme, covered in fried sage. Okay. Very, Very much. Very much. That's what it tastes like when the sea fish meets the Judean mountains. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a great way to, to put it. Is it an Israeli dish? What is it? Ingredients don't really have a nation or a culture. If you cook a fish or you cook a plant and it's coming from uh, uh, behind the 1967 line or, f or fish is coming from the Lebanon uh, Sea or whatever, it still is the same fish. The only border we have is that we use local and seasonal ingredients. We don't cross that border. But all else, there is no borders for us. Toma doesn't care if the fish is from Jaffa or the lamb from Hebron. His produce knows no borders and neither does the team in Rama's kitchen. Muslims and Jews peacefully cook next to each other, quietly achieving in their kitchen what international politics have been dreaming of for decades. In how far would you say food is capable of uh, bridging cultural gaps? The food that we serve, that we are able to take traditional Palestinian dishes and serve them here. It's not on, only a nice concept. We ourselves and our Palestinian neighbors, we now is the season that we go together to pick olives and we meet together, you know, they and us, we bring together the olives to the olive press and we all, you know, press the olives and we wait by the other side and we see this golden liquid coming out and we are excited we are all the same, you know, so we're trying to take off the barriers. Beautiful. <laughs>